Okay, hello, and welcome to tonight's webinar, Introduction to the Short Street Project and the Nature Play Model. I'm Rachel Toker, President of Urban Ecosystem Restorations. Tonight's webinar is brought to you by the Chesapeake Bay Trust, the City of Gaithersburg, UER, and the Lakelands Community Association. We also thank our contractor on the Short Street Project, Greener Visions Landscaping. By way of background, UER is a nonprofit urban land trust that creates, protects, and aggregates what we call eco-functioning spaces. And then we engage people with these spaces in ways that respect nature while allowing people to thrive. So today, I want to tell you about UER's short street project in the city of Gaithersburg, how we incorporated nature play into an environmental restoration project, and empower you with the knowledge and resources you need to incorporate the same principles into your own yard or common area. So first, I will briefly describe the Short Street Project, what it is and what we did. And then I will explain why we used a nature-based solution or as we call it, eco-functioning space at Short Street, the problems we're seeking to address and the benefits we intend to produce. And as we talk about these goals, I'll summarize some basic ecosystem science and some recent research on the connection between nature and our health. Then we'll discuss how certain nature play designs can offer us optimal solutions as we seek to improve ecological and human health. And finally, we'll cover how you can become an ecosystem hero while improving your family's health using your own yard or common area and how the Short Street Project can guide you in this direction. So in this project, UER is converting an old stormwater management basin in the Lakelands community in Gaithersburg into a nature preserve and play space. The Short Street Project is in a triangle that's basically a triangular stormwater basin in one sec sec section of the large Lakelands community. Here you can see its configuration. It's surrounded by three streets and houses. The area was originally designed to capture stormwater from over 1.2 acres of surrounding impervious surface that drains into the site, both as surface runoff and in through large storm drains in the basin. Once the water enters the deepest part of the basin, uh, shown here, sort of on the left side of the triangle, it drains untreated into the grates that are in this section with the green circle uh, directly into the Muddy Branch Creek, which is a key tributary of the Potomac River and the source of the, our drinking water for those who live locally. Here's what the space looked like when we started. It has steep slopes with a smattering of trees in it. It was primarily covered with non-native grasses, including turf grass and invasive species, both of which have negligible ecological value and in some ways uh, de deleterious value. Uh, and it contains large tunnel inlets, stone riprap to slow water coming in through the tunnels and gr the grates that drain the water out into the river. So our vision for the space, uh, this, is, this is one of the original concept plans for transforming this basin into a beautiful eco-functioning space full of a variety of native plant communities um, and play. And we'll discuss eco-functioning spaces in more depth later on, but they're a kind of nature-based solution uh, that return nature structure, processes, and functions to a site, and in doing so, deliver both local and regional benefits. At the site level, our primary goals were first to promote ecological health in the space, um, particularly enabling infiltration of stormwater and supporting biodiversity, and second, to promote human health through immersive educational and playful experiences in nature. 
here you can see the site this past this past December when the installation was finally complete. Um, excuse me, it's a little bit hard to see all the plants because most of them were dormant by December. But we have completely replaced all of the non-native grass with various native plant communities appropriate to the microclimates of this basin. And for a deeper dive into the specifics of the design and the plants of the space, I invite you to take a look at our recorded webinar on the powerful plants of the Short Street Nature Preserve, which is on UER's YouTube channel. Second, we incorporated a set of structures that were designed to facilitate nature play, help people engage with nature through art, uh, to give people of different ages opportunities to sit, walk, run, and jump around the space, uh, mostly in locations that are up and away from the gray stormwater infrastructure. And soon, we will be incorporating um, educational signage and in particular, what we're calling find and seek educational signs that will tie aspects of play into learning about ecosystems, stormwater management and biodiversity. In this project, UER and the city are also studying how these kinds of nature-based solutions can support regional ecosystem health and performance, especially if they can be replicated in large numbers around the city. Generally for urban scale nature-based solutions to succeed, landowners must implement them in large numbers. And let's take a look at why that is. So we are all part of local and regional ecosystems as are the lands that we use and enjoy. We need our ecosystems to be healthy in order to thrive, and they need us. So to understand why nature-based solutions are so important, we need to set a baseline understanding of how ecosystems work and the problems they and we are facing. Healthy, and I, I wanna emphasize healthy ecosystems produce a wide range of ecosystem services. For this talk, I will only focus on what are called regulating ecosystem services, like outdoor air temperature regulation, air filtration, meaning clean air, uh, water filtration or clean water, water cycling and flood management, carbon absorption and sequestration, and the maintenance of food webs that are necessary for food production, just to name a few. This group of services um, is essential for urban societies to operate on a daily basis. These are the need to haves that when people try to perform them without nature's help are very costly and require intensive inputs of energy and resources if people can perform them at all. In fact, some of these services are hyper local to the micro ecosystem itself. So for example, air filtration, uh, health and wellness benefits, urban heat island reductions and outdoor temperature controls uh, and local flood management, are they all happen in the immediate vicinity of the ecosystem or the ecosystem fragment that, perf that is performing those services. So let's look quickly at what ecosystems are and then learn what it means to have a healthy ecosystem. So ecosystems are the natural systems in which we live. They are dynamic and complex. They're composed of living and non-living things in relationship with each other across individuals and whole communities. Ecosystems are defined by the functional connections among these individuals, communities, and their non-living environment across land, air, and sea, both above and below ground, through transfers of matter and energy, among communities of plants that have evolved together over time and the animals that have co-evolved with them and across generations as they succeed each other over time. Ecosystems create the context and circumstances that we all need to live, grow, and survive through future generations. Just like the systems in our bodies, our nervous system, circulatory system, digestive system, for example, 
they're all performing their own particular functions, all while interacting with each other and while working together to make our bodies work as a whole. Damaging or destroying these relationships can destroy the system entirely. So ecosystems can be healthy or unhealthy. And how do we know when an ecosystem is healthy? Well, in a healthy ecosystem, all the subsystems are working and interacting with each other. And we know that's happening when we see these indicators, biological and genetic diversity, meaning diverse forms of plant and animal life, interaction diversity, meaning that if we look at species interactions, we see a lot of interactions. So are they feeding off each other? Do they use each other to reproduce? Are they supporting each other's health? This is where an evolutionary history together really matters. We look at structural diversity, meaning that there are many different species occupying different spaces and niches within the area. We also see regular cycling of materials and energy through the system. Uh, for example, you see dead leaves with microorganisms that are going, that are decomposing those leaves and driving nutrients back into the cycle, um, the soil cycle. And um, this will eventually contribute to soil and plant health. So we're seeing cycling um, of, of matter and chemical components and energy through the system. And, final, and there's also clear generational succession. So we can see species of all different ages coming up um, with mature trees and baby trees and so on and so forth across the animal and plant communities. And green spaces that reflect these indicators are often labeled high quality green spaces. In addition, Ecosystems need to be of a sufficient size to serve the populations that are relying on them. And in today's world, we increasingly need to connect intact ecosystems to one another. So connectivity is one other aspect of healthy ecosystems. These drivers of health then create regula regulating processes that ensure the ecosystem is strong enough to return to normal after a shock or intense disturbance. So ecosystems as spatial units occur at all different sizes and scales, and they're usually embedded within larger ecosystems. Eco-functioning spaces like Short Street will operate as a tiny intact ecosystem, and it will contribute to the larger ecosystem surrounding it. Every piece of land either promotes or weakens the natural interactions and processes that our ecosystems use to remain healthy. So for example, in the case of Short Street, when we restore native plant communities, these plant communities can manage influxes of stormwater on site. Uh, they'll take that up, they'll turn that into uh, pollinator services and other kinds of food web support, heat island mitigation, um, and they'll also minimize the amount of untreated water that's going straight into the Muddy Branch Creek. Um, and that's helping maintain the integrity of the waterway and has other city and regional benefits as well. So at the regional scale, to have a healthy ecosystem, we need a lot of high quality uh, urban nature and nature of all kinds. We need it in high quantity and we need it to be connected in connected corridors of what we would call eco-functioning spaces. So what's the problem that we are looking at and trying to address? Well, here are the predominant land uses of our urban and suburban spaces. And here's what those uses do to key indicators of ecosystem health. So if you're looking at this as a spectrum of urban nature, we see biodiversity, interaction diversity, complexity, cycling of matter and energy and generational succession all deteriorate as we move from left to right. As we cultivate traditional urban and suburban land uses, 
we destroy the attributes of healthy ecosystems and reduce ecosystem function, and then we lose ecosystem services. We haven't just uh, created these uses in compact areas. We have expanded these traditional land uses across larger and larger swaths of land for decades. Uh, here you can see a dramatic expansion of development in Maryland and in particular Montgomery County. Um, and it only, this is visual only shows till 2010. Traditional suburban development leaves compacted soils, pavement, turf grass and invasive species in place of functioning ecosystems and native habitat. So this is ecologically devastating as urban footprints grow. And because this is a hallmark of cities across the US and even the world, these patterns have contributed to widespread ecosystem degradation internationally. But most of us are not really aware of how deeply these problems are connected to the loss of nature where we live, work, and play. In our own neighborhoods, these traditional land uses cause or exacerbate everything from flooding and pollution to widespread mental health and chronic diseases. So to recap, uh, the long established interactions of living things and system cycles drive healthy ecosystems. Healthy ecosystems provide essential ecosystem services that manage stormwater, provide fresh air, ensure working food webs, and mitigate climate change. They also help us adapt to environmental disturbances and extreme weather. So here's the good news which is that suffering ecosystems can return to health when large numbers of people use their lands for nature-based solutions that restore the drivers of ecosystem health. These drivers can occur on urban and suburban lands if we support them with the right kinds of landscape designs and maintenance practices. And eco-functioning spaces can be designed for almost any open space. And here's the even better news. We are healthier with nature-based solutions. Research is showing that the benefits of exposure to healthy ecosystems, or what some call high quality urban nature, range from reducing blood glucose levels to improving heart rate variability and ventricular function, to improving our immune system function, to improving concentration and cerebral blood flow. And the research is continuing to expand and evolve these findings. So scientists have proposed a variety of hypotheses to explain why nature has these effects and what are the physical or psychological mechanisms that occur in the body in response to nature. We don't know definitively uh, we do know that one hypothesis is the biodiversity hypothesis, which states that physical exposure and interaction with unpolluted biodiverse natural environments balances certain chemical and hormonal processes of the body and can strengthen our immune systems, especially when exposed as children. Whether this is all or just a part of the explanation, it's an important consideration when we're choosing what kinds of environments to surround ourselves with. In my research, um, I found that to really maximize health effects, there are at least three essential pieces to the puzzle. Uh, maximizing health effects through exposure to nature and time in nature. And they are first, we need what you might think of as a high dose, where dose is measured both by ecological quality and by quantity, so that it's enough of high quality nature to have a sensory experience of feeling immersed in nature. Uh, second, we need these high quality natural areas close by, both for the localized environmental benefits that they provide like pollutant reduction and heat island mitigation, but also to support the third factor, which is frequency. To really get health benefits out of nature, we need to expose ourselves regularly and often to the natural space over time. 
And generally we're thinking in terms of weekly, if not daily interactions. There are three other features that are really important to maximize health effects. Uh, the first is having a sense of safety in this space. Uh, the second is some form of crowd control, uh, which can occur naturally depending on where the space is located, uh, and some level of health programming or programming that teaches participants how to get the maximum benefit out of the nature experience. Both the design and the programming of the space should be disease and trauma informed when we're looking at sensitive populations. And for more detail about these findings, please join UER for a webinar coming up later this spring about how to maximize the health effects of spending time in nature. So to go back to nature-based solutions, oops, sorry and how we make our, um, our nature-based solutions optimized for these purposes. Uh, as UER says, we like to make every square foot count. So to do that, we start with eco-functioning spaces and we lay the foundation for ensuring that we will address both ecological and human health. So eco-functioning spaces restore the structure, interactions, and processes that make our ecosystems healthy at their core. And then we layer in activities that boost human health. With the right design and maintenance, you can not only manage stormwater and support biodiversity in your yard or common area, but you can also reduce heat islands, reduce heat islands, address climate change, improve your local air quality, and improve your mental and physical health. And it all starts with planting native trees, shrubs, and perennials and removing invasive species in our landscapes. So eco-functioning spaces improve our local environment, which itself promotes health. And then we can emphasize features that enrich physical and mental health benefits through our designs. And we can incorporate options for both active and passive activities in the space. And this is where nature play can pay can, nature play can play a pivotal role, especially for children. Nature play is defined as a learning process, engaging children in working together to develop physical skills, to exercise their imaginations, to stimulate poetic expression, and to begin to understand the workings of the world around them. Nature Play uses a designated outdoor area where children of all ages and abilities play and learn by engaging with diverse natural elements, materials, organisms, and habitats through sensory, fine motor, and gross motor experiences. Nature Play promotes movement and connection while improving mental and physical health. And here are just a few examples of nature play settings. These areas can range in the level of physical demand, risk, and educational components. But it's important to note that nature play is about playing in and enjoying nature. It's not nature on the side. This is not where we carve up space so the environment gets its share and we get ours. This is where we share one space and get a larger space for both of us in the process. Too often though, people see high quality urban nature as space reserved for non-humans, while they view traditional urban land covers as space for us. This is a major psychological and behavioral barrier that we need to break through in order to expand high quality urban nature and achieve ecosystem health so that we benefit from the healthiest ways to be outside and interact with nature while we heal the systems around us. As we design our nature play areas, we can and shouldn't lose sight of what maximizes both ecosystem and human health. So let's recap. Um, nature needs biodiversity, complexity, general, generational succession, and cycling of matter and energy. People need biodiversity, complexity, 
uh, novelty of which both biodiversity and complexity contribute, proximity and frequency, and people also need some sense of immersion and safety. There is tremendous overlap here if we, if we think in advance and take advantage of it. So here are some of the features of the Short Street Project and the choices we're making there in order to maximize environmental and health benefits. So our structures include a playhouse, balanced logs, uh, climbing ramp, walking and running path, our lookout perch with, uh, with telescopes and the educational signage that's coming. I will just note that due to budget and space constraints, we targeted uh, uh, ages of children under 12 um, because it was it, we did not have the budget and the space to promote active play for a 12 to 18 year old demographic, except that the running path, uh, the running and walking path and the stumps are always uh, fun for teenagers. We also have noted teenagers in the playhouse. Um, so they're finding ways to enjoy it as well. Uh, and we also have created certain features to multifunction, to function either for active play or for seating spaces. Uh, all features are either in shade or partial shade. Uh, here's another set of pictures of the space. Um, this, this set includes our event where we unveiled the nature art poles, which have nature art tiles that people and kids, um, where they expressed their understanding of nature or a piece of nature uh, in clay tiles that are posted on these nature poles. Um, and so these structures will, in, will enable games like hide and seek, find and seek, imaginative, imaginative play, jumping, balancing, running, walking, um, and climbing. And they're just fun. So um, I wanted to say that although in these pictures, the plant installations largely weren't in when we, um, when we featured uh, the original installation of the nature play aspects, uh, those will be coming. And as I mentioned, the plants are largely young and dormant right now, but I did want to just show you a, a picture of what the space will look like. Um, once the vegetation is mature, we will have, and actually let me um, scroll down a little bit more. The, this Here you can see the walking path with the playhouse up here. Um, these are the balance logs, and hopefully one day we will also include a um, uh, some ropes and ties where people can hang and balance. Um, and then there's going to be a lot of perennials down in what we call the wet meadow, and up here right next to the um, right next to the playhouse. But we're also creating a lot of vertical structure. So just to show you uh, a handful of the plants, and it eventually when this grows in, there will be a greater sense of immersion in nature. Um, but we have added understory trees and bushes, uh, which include red buds and elderberry and viburnum, all of which are high value um, native plants. Uh, we're also adding just a whole lot of perennials, most of which are high value in terms of biodiversity support, as well as hardy and good for stormwater management. So we'll be hitting sort of every structural level and every niche um, that's available in the space. So uh, in summary, Evidence suggests that ecologically healthy, high quality urban nature that's close to where we live and work and that's easy to access is essential for maximizing environmental and human health benefits. And when we move, enjoy, play and build social connections within it, we get the best of all worlds. These frequent exposures to healthy ecosystems are particularly important for children. 
So what better way to maximize health than creating quality urban nature in your front or backyard or nearby common area? Uh, so we need more high quality connected urban nature that serves ecological needs and is located where people can access it daily. Talk to UER about easy first steps you can take. You may think that your yard is small, but when we start stitching small yards together, we get larger and larger areas and eventually we rebuild and restore our damaged ecosystems for the health of the larger environment and our own families. Thank you.